I know there still will be a few more people arriving, but I thought we should uh, get underway because we have a really incredible group of professionals who are going to share their stories um, with us today on this uh, really incredible topic. Um, if I could remind people to put things on vibration, uh, phones, pagers, whatever. Um, and then I also will uh, make a disclosure. Um, I can't believe it's been 10 years since the <laughs> Lifespan Clinic started because I remember all the pushing, collaborating meetings yeah. to try and see if we could get people together um, to even talk about the idea of across the parking lot having a clinic uh, that would provide support to our youth um, as they move into the adult phase. And, and I think for the families, and we're fortunate to have a few families here in the uh, audience today, um, it didn't come soon enough. Uh, we were hearing for years and years about this cliff that our families um, and youth were pushed over. And um, I, I think it's wonderful to see that we've come to our 10th anniversary. So I'd like to um, just uh, introduce our wonderful speakers we have today. Um, for most of you, maybe you can stand up so you're not hiding. Andrea Lausanne um, is our NP and was actually our first NP. Um, first NP and kind of the second wave of NPs at Blurview. Yes. yes, so we are thrilled to have Andrea, who has actually been instrumental in pulling um, the presentation and uh, our speakers together. Um, we have Mark, Dr. Mark Bailey, who is a physiatrist at Toronto Rehab and um, I won't say that you're as old as I am, but we do go back a very <laughs> long way. <laughs> uh, next, we have Amy Spears, occupational therapist on the Lifespan team. Lisa Colstandi, uh, sorry, I'm not going in order, uh, speech therapist. Um, uh, Margot uh, Catazone, if I'm pronouncing, I apologize, a physiotherapist um, on the clinic. And Victoria Ventura in the center, if you can wave Victoria who is this incredibly beautiful young woman who I knew when she was really little. So anyways, we're thrilled to have you here as well. So welcome and thank you all. Thanks, Golda. And thank you everyone for taking time out of your busy schedules to come this for the next hour. So as Golda was mentioning, the lifespan and the partnership between Hall and Blairview Kids Rehabilitation and University Health Network Toronto Rehab started probably long before 2006, but the formal partnership developed in 2006, and that's where Lifespan grew out of. And Lifespan, for those who don't know, stands for Living Independently, Fully Engaged. By the end of the hour, we hope to um, impart our objectives, which are describing features of the Lifespan service today, discussing trends noticed by the adult Lifespan team, youth and parents, and describe some unique challenges of managing adults with chronic pain and promoting emotional wellness. So some of the features of today's lifespan model. Um, we have the lifespan, which is sort of phase two to phase five. However, transition starts long before um, anybody makes it to lifespan for those who come through lifespan. And transition starts at the very first appointment at Hall and Blurview. Every interaction between staff, children, youth, and families provides an opportunity to share expertise, provide disability education, health promotion, anticipatory guidance to encourage engagement in healthcare. Phase two is the referral to lifespan for those who have cerebral palsy or neuromotor challenges and require a team approach for transition. Our team members here include myself, a social worker, youth facilitator, and a life skills coach. I'm the medical lead for some of the clients who come through Lifespan who aren't followed by a developmental pediatrician, another nurse practitioner, or a physiatrist. And we work on the philosophy of shared management, which is a model that promotes doing with the clients and families. Phase three occurs around 17 to 18 years old, where the youth and lifespan are then offered um, a connection with adult rehabilitation. And those with cerebral palsy 
are able to go over to Lifespan Service at, at Toronto Rehab, or there's also an adult physiatrist who follows um, with, for rehabilitation through Sunnybrook Health Sciences Centre. Phase four is our lifespan service at UHN Toronto Rehab, which I will explain in a bit more detail. And phase five is our graduation from lifespan. And this is for youth when they're prepared to manage their adult lives, including their disability, accessing adult health care, recreation, fitness, employment, and public services available in their communities. We also have sort of a phase six, but for those who do require um, and want to increase their goal set and their skill set, they're able to reactivate lifespan over at Toronto Rehab to come in for a consultation or for short-term interventions. The shared management model is um, used here in lifespan um, and was used to develop the Growing Up Ready framework. I think that was around, the, around 2006, um, if not earlier, time frame as well. And the model shows the skill development from um, receiving care for infants and youth to gradually increasing their skill set to participate in care, manage care, and supervising care. I would say most individuals will not be the CEO of their care by 18, however, um, it's, it's a model that we use, and I think we also continue to use some the same strategies along with our self-management model over at Toronto Rehab. And then, of course, there is a subset of youth who will be reliant on their parents to provide care. Our teams at Hall & Blurview and at Toronto Rehab include manager, and a service coordinator at Toronto Rehab, a physiatrist, uh, myself, occupational therapist at Toronto Rehab, physio at Toronto Rehab, social worker at both, Hall and Blurview and Toronto Rehab, speech language pathology at Toronto Rehab, our youth facilitator and life skills coach are cross appointed, so they're um, a day at both hospitals, and we have administ administrative support. The adult lifespan uh, service, the original proposal uh, was sent to the Ministry of Health in 2006 requesting, um, with an, requesting annual increases in resources and expansions. Um, so the initial proposal was for um, transition of youth from Hall and Blairview with cerebral palsy or brain injury. And that was funded in 2007, 2008. Currently, we have over 430 active clients, and there's approximately 80 on our wait list, and we receive about 100 referrals every year. So because we've outgrown our 70, uh, we've looked at our model, and we've identified some new approaches with the focus on self-management to enable the readiness for discharge. So our lifespan refresh has been occurring over the past year over at Toronto Rehab, and we were focusing on uh, the process for clinic days, as well as partnerships with community organizations for inclusive fitness and employment. And we also looked at other standard processes within cl clinic, and we created an orientation program called Making Connections that is, we're going to pilot it this year, and it's offered three to four times a year, and we'll provide an overview of the adult lifespan uh, service to clients and families who've been referred, as well as a tour of uh, Rumsey Neuro. It introduces the shift to self-management and includes or in, to encourage the generation, generation of individual goals to manage their own care. And it's an opportunity as well to hear from a youth who has transitioned through the lifespan service. We also discuss expectations and responsibilities of clients and families and team members. So the family then knows what they can expect of us. Our guiding principles are to uh, support clients and their families to develop skills. As I mentioned, we're to develop partnerships with clients and community providers, providing age and developmentally appropriate services 
to focus on increasing um, self-management and to develop, to develop and share expertise in the management of chronic health care needs. Our philosophy, we use a consultative model. So uh, we provide recommendations with, again, self-management as the key principle in our model. Focusing on helping youth and their parents to develop skills to manage their care and navigate the healthcare system. The self-management um, box at the bottom is an example of uh, what different types of topics and how they're presented that we have in our lifespan questionnaire that is given to every youth at every clinic visit in order to help them generate some ideas or areas of goals that they would like to speak with the staff about. We have quite a few groups and workshops for both uh, patients and then two workshops for the caregivers, caregiver communication and caregiver movement. And again, with the premise of uh, working towards self-management and setting goals. Our second objective is just to over give you a brief overview of some of the trends that we've seen in lifespan. And what we've seen is that many of our youth are more sedentary than their peers. Guardianship is challenged and is a challenge met by um, parents in the adult system. There is less pediatric providers involved um, as they transition to lifespan over at Toronto Rehab. Caregivers are feeling lost and helpless. Increasing number of mental health episodes. There is an increase in chronic pain and less independent skill development in our youth. With respect to the pediatric providers, over the years I have gradually seen that there's less youth being followed by pediatricians. There's still, you know, some that are followed by pediatricians, however, more are able to connect with family doctors, um, which is really helpful to see. And in the very recent past, the past two years, I've seen um, pediatric specialists not necessarily referring to adult specialists such as um, neurologists and rheumatologists. So we often ask in terms of who their specialists are just to make sure they're connected with um, the specialists in the adult system. I will now pass it over to Amy and I will continue to move the slides forward. So just continuing on with um, outlining some of the trends that I've seen in Lifespan. Um, I've been on Lifespan for a, a little over four years now. Um, so one of the things I've really noticed is that their ADLs and their school accommodations are usually really well addressed by the time they get to us, especially if they've already started college. So that's um, really great. Um, however, some of their instrumental activities of daily living, and in which we, I think that some of the clients are very capable of, they're still lacking in a lot of those skills that they need to fully participate in the activities um, as a young adult in society, including things like school, like Im imminent things that are coming up. So things like even simple things like crossing the road, using public transit, booking their own wheel trans, um, going into a store to buy a few simple things. Um, things that, uh, that we're talking about clients who would be capable of doing these things and they really haven't tried to do some of these things. Um, meeting a friend in the community or attending a recreation or a fitness activity on their own. Because um, I, you know, these are some things that maybe could be started a bit earlier. And also just advocacy for themselves, taking the initiative. Um, to make a plan and to achieve a desired outcome. So rather than being very passive and waiting for others to notice what they need or want, um, learning how to take action on their own. Um, and with expectations, I think sometimes people um, will often live up or down to the expectations that we set for them. Um, and so we've really tried to um, make it known that we have high expectations. Um, and I think that studies suggest that increasing expectations from an early age, from family, school, 
and society, which would include healthcare workers, I think, um, as well as supporting social competencies might increase the chance of employment for people with cerebral palsy. So speaking of employment, um, one of the other trends that we've noticed is that, um, and that I notice, is um, that a lot of our clients have limited work and volunteer experience. Um, so in Lifespan, in the past, we've offered um, a getting ready for work group, and we offer one-to-one -one skills, interest assessments, um, skills practice, and job search support, and that was often through um, myself and our youth facilitator. Um, however, um, we also help clients connect to employment agencies in the community. Anecdotally, we noticed, though, that there was limited success that the agencies had in finding our clients um, sort of meaningful long-term employment, and that didn't need to be, or volunteer, and that didn't need to be full-time or anything like that. It could even just be, you know, six hours a week, two days a week for three hours. Um, so within the past year, we've started looking at other ways of improving volunteer and employment outcomes for our clients by working in partnership with job developers and job coaches from community agencies. Um, so one agency that we specifically partnered with this year was called um, St. Stephen's Community House, which is located at Bathurst and St. Clair. Um, and we're also working on some other, with some other community partners on some other initiatives, which are kind of in the preliminary stages, so that's sort of TBA, um, and including working with um, someone from Blurview. So uh, you guys probably all know Carolyn McDougall. I'm not no, sure if she's here, but she's also someone that we have been working with, and she's uh, the project lead for employment and transition strategy at Blurview. Thank you. Hi, everyone. So I'm Margo, and I'm the, I'm the physiotherapist. Um, so again, I'm just going to speak to some of the trends I'm noticing. And um, for one, as Andrea already touched on, is our youth coming to us are quite generally very sedentary. They spend the majority of their waking hours in sedentary behaviors. And with that also, um, often it's uh, a low self-efficacy to be physically active on their own. And <clears throat> I think we all know um, all of the, the risks of being sedentary and how that affects our health and leads to chronic illness. And so of course, this is not ideal. And I think all of my points kind of are all linked together. Um, what a few of the youth that did come in uh, agreed to do some more fitness testing with me this year and we were noticing that the deconditioning that they were showing in their early 20s was really similar to that of what we'd see in a geriatric patient even after a stroke or you know for, so for instance they had um, cardiovascular conditioning that made it so that when they were working at their maximum capacity they'd be doing what we would consider really light uh, light intensity work, so even just walking, or their balance was such that there was no uh, reactive balance strategies in place so that if they did trip, they would fall uh, in the community or at home, and or even just not having the strength in their legs to get up from a chair. So those were the sort of things we were noticing. And with that, there's, um, <clears throat> I'll skip to my next point about um, the clients being fallers, so uh, a lot of them are coming into clinic every year and they're saying, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm doing okay, I'm not falling that much, I fall maybe twice a week. And, you know, for us, like, that's quite a lot. And <clears throat> because of that, a lot of people are talking about how they're not going out as much or they're really not going to social events and they're not participating with their friends because they have this fear of falling if they're in a crowd, if they're out and about, or if they're outside of the home and they don't know how they're going to get back up, right? So <clears throat> with that, again, it's all, uh, all of these factors kind of are linked back to one another, right? It's just going back to the quality of life and really um, how the physical activity levels and physical fitness really um, are, are required to have a, a higher quality of life. 
And then the caregivers are coming in, especially when we're talking about our clients who are wheelchair dependent. The caregivers are coming in and they're there trying to advocate for their children and you can just see that they're in so much physical pain and their backs, their joints, everything's sore. And um, it's just so hard for them to be really every single day um, meeting the demands of all of the care it takes, uh, all the care requirements, but then also being in pain while doing so. Uh, and then of course, as I'm sure you guys are all already aware, there's so many barriers to our clients accessing uh, physical activity options in the community. I think there's this uh, universal, universal barriers for all of us for being more physically active, but then those with physical or cognitive impairments have additional barriers. Um, and a lot of it is lack of knowledge of their own bodies and how to move them. Um, but, <clears throat> but unfortunately, a big part of it too is um, attitudinal barriers in the community or just really inadequacy of the programs and equipment and facilities out there. And then a lot of what I'm seeing is people coming in wanting to, or expressing you know, that their, their biggest issues are around spasticity and they think that Botox is the cure-all. Um, so being able to sit down and really talk about ways to get to know your spasticity triggers and um, ways to manage those better and options for exercising, you know, with spasticity, that sort of stuff. Or for clients who might not be very physically active, what are some other management strategies we can do to help you be more comfortable, sleep better, that sort of thing. And then same goes for scoliosis education. Um, I th think a lot of our caregivers are coming in very, the scoliosis is the impairment that they can see in their child, that the one that's the most visible, and they fear that that is what's causing all of the pain and all of the harm to their child. So often a lot of reassurance about the neuromuscular scoliosis does go a long way. <clears throat> and then finally, I think also just um, noticing how there's so much room to talk about other health promoting behaviors, not just physical activities. So uh, healthy eating, sleep hygiene, and um, even so many people have been so receptive to the idea of mindfulness um, practices, which has been so lovely, especially for those families who feel that, you know, my child, like I have to, they're, they're stuck at home, what can they do? And to be able to put on like a mindfulness video or, or guided meditation, um, people have just been so receptive to it. It's been really lovely to, to experience that. And so some of the things I've tried is developing new groups. So a caregiver body mechanics group, which has been a huge success so far. And then also a group, um, that I've called, I've dubbed Workout Warriors, which was um, for our clients who do have physical impairments, but want to learn how to work out in their bodies um, and access fitness in the community. So those have both been successful. We've just run one, uh, the pilots of both of those groups last year. And <clears throat> I think just a lot of conversations I've been having a lot of conversations about barriers to physical activity and barriers to being more active and just trying to break those down and problem solving with the families. Um, but it's been a lot of getting creative and seeing what we can do and there's still a long way to go. Um, so now I'm just going to share some perspectives from caregivers and youth who couldn't be here today but wanted to share some information um, about their perspective with you as well as um, we have Victoria here today, a client of ours on Lifespan who also will share a bit of her perspective a little bit later on. Um, just starting with some caregiver perspectives uh, related to what Margot was just saying, I think um, you'll hear a lot from this caregiver. So she says, my son needs me to be well so that I can help him be well. I know that he is the patient, but he relies on me. When I'm hurt or sick, he may stay in bed for two weeks and do absolutely nothing. That's not good. That hurts him. From an early age, we need more skill building for the parents, learning how to keep our own body safe, learning all the resources available to our children, to us, better preparing for finding our way once they turn 18. In the year after his discharge from Holland Blurview, waiting for his lifespan appointment, I cried every single day. I cried because I felt completely lost. I felt depressed, abandoned. I did not know how to help my son. 
One thing that made it worse is that I was sent an application for DSO funding when he was 16, but no one explained what it is or why I needed to apply at that time. The application said it was for 18 years and older, so I assumed I did not have to apply yet. When he was almost 18 and being discharged, they asked me why I had not applied. I did not understand the process and that it took so much time. I applied after that, but now he's 19 and on the wait list still. I lost all this time because it was not clear to me what I needed to do. I let my son down. Also, from the time my son was five, I began having back and body pains, helping him crawl, stand, wash, and eat. And the bigger he got, the worse it got. I endured years of pain, but I had no choice. I am a single parent, and that is my son, and I will do whatever it takes. Over the last decade, my pain became worse and worse, and I cried every single day and spent days at home, days at a time, unable to move. When I came here and I did the caregiver movement program and with a few simple tips and learning about my body, much of my pain has gone away. I only wish I'd learned these strategies earlier so that I could have avoided years of pain that hurt not only my body but my mind. I feel better now that the pain is gone and it makes all the difference. Uh, what I want them to know is that I needed more support to learn how to best help my son. At the end of the day, my skills and knowledge is what will ensure my son is okay. You can't separate the parent from the patient. So that's just the perspective from one of our caregivers um, who's recently come to Lifespan. We also have a perspective of another caregiver um, who will tell us a little bit more about her experience with respect to um, guardianship. So her story. My daughter received a letter from the Canada Revenue Agency that she was being audited and had to provide information. I called the CRA and I was told that I could not speak with them unless I proved I had guardianship for my daughter who is 19 years old. I contacted Arch Disability Law and the public guardian and trustee who informed me that they could not help me. I was given a list of lawyers and phone numbers to call. I spoke with a lawyer on the list. She asked for my postal code and I was informed, you cannot pay my fee. She continued to ask me questions about what I was looking for and told me I needed to be a substitute decision maker for my daughter and not her guardian. This is very confusing for me. It would be helpful to have this sorted out before she turned 18 years old. Um, so those are the perspectives of some of our caregivers. We'll now move on to some of the youth perspectives, and we'll start off with having Victoria share a little bit about her perspective. So we asked Victoria um, to describe some challenges that she has with school and work, um, and to give her perspective on what she would like pediatric providers to know, and any recommendations or tips for growing up with CP. I see a lot of familiar faces in the crowd, so it makes me feel a little bit more comfortable. Um, so the first question is, it says, describe any challenges that you have with school and work. And the first thing I can think of is managing my fatigue levels is a really huge challenge because I'm dealing with school, responsibilities of social life. So how do I actually manage my fatigue levels when they do really become exasperated with all the responsibility put on my body? Um, the second one, which is one that we're kind of drilled into us is fitting in an appropriate exercise regime um, with all the responsibilities of school and work. It tends to be really difficult to fit in an appropriate and uh, long enough duration of exercise in a day, um, especially because I tend to use a scooter and a walker, but I can also walk with canes. So how do you actually fit in appropriate exercise for the day? And the third thing, which is kind of um, a weird one, but I thought about it, is travel. So I sit a lot in the wheelchair. And getting in the seated position and then getting up in my daily activities is really, really difficult. So for example, after I go to school, I might stand eat dinner, just to give my body a little bit of a different setting. Um, and it's finding a way to adjust what my body needs with what my schedule is and it can be difficult once you get older and you have work, school, social life, and all the other things that come along with growing up. Um, the second question is what would I like pediatric providers to know? Um, the main challenge for me was as I got older I felt like I wasn't the primary manager of my own health care because in Blurview my parents were always taking over and it didn't give me a chance to really learn about 
what CP is and how I can manage it, how I can modify it, how can I adjust it, and then adding all the other things that you do in, a, in your life that might make it difficult. Um, so um, having a really targeted program, maybe from 15 to 18, where we kind of move away from the parents' um, objective and move toward what the clients really need to learn to manage further. Um, and also like for you guys to show us how to adapt it, how to uh, modify it, and also model the management style that you would like for us to adopt later on. And if you do a little bit earlier, then it will give us a chance to ask you questions and have a little bit less stress on our shoulders because we're younger, so we don't really have a lot of responsibilities. Um, and for advice, what I would like to say is for families, have really high expectations of what your, your kids or what your child can achieve and don't think, don't expect them to do anything less than what their best is. For youth, I would say it's really difficult to manage like the whole beast, but instead uh, work with um, smaller goals and set yourself up for success and say, what do I need to know? What don't I know? And how can I get like the resources that I need to learn? And then work from there. Um, and also make sure that you ask questions because you guys are here to help us, but we're, we're maybe, might be really shy and not as confident and not as advocate focused. So really try and ask the questions that you need. And also really work toward being a proactive manager of your own healthcare instead of reactive, which I've been through many programs here and they're great, but like putting them all together and work toward cl the client really learning is going to make it a really long-term success instead of short-term. Um, yeah. That's right. Thanks very much, Victoria. And we um, at the end for questions, and we encourage questions to everyone, but also to Victoria as well. Um, next, we'll hear a little bit of a perspective from Mohammed, who will talk a little bit about his experience with regards to um, work in school. Um, so Mohammed says, in terms of challenges he had at work in school, getting to and from work or school is difficult for me. There wasn't much to go on when I was finishing up high school. No one really helped me decide what route to take. There was no analysis of what I would be able to do with my disability. I went into IT at college, but I'm not working in IT due to the bending and lifting requirements and the job was not accessible. I wish someone had told me in advance what parts of jobs would be inaccessible instead of keeping quiet. In terms of advice Mohammed has for healthcare providers, he says, keep an open mind and try to treat us like people without disabilities. Give us the same opportunities. Having the opportunity to try means everything. He was also asked about what interventions have been helpful for him, and he says, Lifespan program was very helpful, definitely. That work survey, employment assessment, that you did, and helping me to get that summer job. Thanks to you guys really got me going. Other things that helped point me in the right direction, helping me get my G2 assessment, helping me get work experience, talking with people who understand got me out of depression. It's like... Andrea was a psychiatrist, made me feel normal because you all work with lots of people same as me or worse. Also giving me homework and making me do stuff myself. Uh, we have the perspectives of just two more youth to share with you today. Um, so Alex, um, we have two named Alex, but Alex C describes, my challenges at both work and school have been pain management, Pain for me is relatively constant, although the level of pain varies. Medication side effects can often be sedating. I've gotten into trouble at work for looking sleepy. I also know that pain and medication has affected my memory at work. This can affect how quickly I complete tasks. I know that some of my peers at work and school have thought I was spacey or uninterested because they don't know what I'm dealing with. In some work environments, I've found that I cannot talk about what I'm dealing with. I'm not too sure how to explain my health problems without revealing too much, making me appear too sick to do my job and handle more responsibility. 
in terms of recommendations for growing up with CP and some learnings for healthcare providers, she says, I think it's very important that pediatric providers understand what their patients' work and education goals are so that they can fit treatment to their patient's lifestyle. Patients need to understand the side effects of medication. Will a medication be sedating or affect memory? Is this a reason to change the dosage or try something else? The speed of work environments can also be problematic. Many jobs lack sufficient training programs. People should be educated on the workplace accommodations that they can ask for, such as a standing desk. In my experience, I've found school much more accommodating because of the policies and supports in place at universities. It would also be helpful for patients with similar conditions or struggles to be able to talk to one another so they know that they're not alone. It would be helpful to understand if the challenges they're facing at work or school are because of their own shortcomings um, and inexperience or a consequence of their disability and medication. Uh, lastly, we have Alex F. Um, also sharing his perspectives about challenges with school, work, and some advice for healthcare providers and uh, tips um, for growing up with a brain injury. Uh, Alex says, fortunately, my current job is a desk job, so there are rarely any physical challenges, but primarily the challenges I've experienced with school and work revolve around my short-term memory, which I feel is my biggest weakness. This caused challenges in completing high school and college. Luckily, I had amazing support from family and friends, as well as support from Bloorview and the Lifespan team to help me develop techniques to deal with my short-term memory weakness. He would like pediatric providers to know. Um, if I could, I would recommend that Bloorview provide more support for clients with brain injuries to learn strategies for reading, as well as general life skills. Living independently provides such a higher quality of life and it's important that TBI survivors are prepared. Additionally, I can honestly say I don't think I'd be where I am today without all the help and services that I received over the years through both Blurview and Toronto Rehab. He has a few recommendations for growing up with a TBI. Um, prior to my injury, I was always a really determined kid and I feel that my determination helped my recovery significantly, along with all the services provided by both Blurview and Toronto Rehab. Progress feels so much more rewarding if you set small goals and work towards them. For me, I don't know if I'll ever be able to lift my left arm above my head, but that doesn't mean I'm going to stop trying. After my accident, I was absolutely terrified of failure and hated the idea of being different from everyone else. However, there are so many services and programs available that can set you and your family up for success. If I could make only one recommendation, it would be to take advantage of all the programs offered. They will help you achieve your goals. So we just wanted to wrap up with a couple of really significant challenges that we're seeing, and you've already heard, it, heard them allu alluded to, um, one of which is chronic pain. And uh, just, you, you may not, I think one of the things I would really want to emphasize is that, w particularly in Alex, who you heard from, a lot of effort was put into getting Alex walking. There were surgeries. She had multiple surgeries. She had, um, you know, braces, and she really put a lot of effort into walking. Um, she had a quite a pronounced uh, scoliosis and as also a lumbar lordosis by the time she was finished. And she had to get around university, and she's typical of many of our clients, she had to get around university walking. And a lot of effort was put into getting her walking, and that walking left her in a great deal of pain. So the dialogue about walking and how much walking you should do and what devices you should use is a really critical dialogue because at the end of the day she's on very strong medications to manage some of the long-term complications of getting up walking. I know that parents always want patients walking. I understand the challenge. I've worked in pediatrics myself. However, I think that an open dialogue about the co energy cost of walking, uh, many of you know from the spina bifida, con you know, on the days that the kids walk with their brace, they don't concentrate as well at school. It's probably very similar for the populations we serve. So I just, I, I can't, that's a really critical thing. We've seen kids who have hip dysplasia and who've, you know, walked on their hip for many years and they're having joint replacements, joint arthroplasties at the age of 22, 23. So a lot of effort went into getting them up walking a lot of pain 
uh, left over, unfortunately. It's not everybody, but it, I think a balanced view of what walking means to the individual is important. Uh, similarly, we have, we've already heard about the challenge of prolonged sitting in wheelchairs. It's, uh, Margo has um, been really working hard on this one, and we really want to improve that. And as Alex highlighted, finding medications for pain management without side effects is a real big challenge that we face. Another thing that I think uh, we're all kind of loosely aware of, but as kids transition from pediatrics to adulthood, um, we, were, we were, as you may know, Andrea joined us from the mental health area. And uh, at the first time, we thought this would be all about physical medicines kind of stuff. And I'd have to say that mental health issues are very unique and we're so excited that Andrea brought that with her um, because we have a significant number of individuals who have their first onset of psychosis. As you know, any kind of brain insult predisposes you to psychiatric issues and mental health issues. Brain health is mental health and so we often see these things. Um, we have seen huge challenges as in people getting uh, socially isolated and um, we see anxiety and depression being quite common, as you heard. Indeed, we started a project that was supported by the N Nurse Practitioners Association of Ontario, where we screen everybody with the uh, PHQ-4 for anxiety and depression. And the scary news is that of the 133 we've screened so far, 73 have come back positive with a, for anxiety and depression. So this is a serious issue that um, we all need to work together. And then we've also seen the behavioral challenges of some of the folks with ABI in particular who grow up and their parents are dealing now with a very tall young man who's still a little irritable and still gets upset. I think one of the things that we've really learned as part of the self-care thing is we've learned that, uh, you know, the focus in, dis in pediatrics is in supporting the education of the parents and as you've heard from all, a lot of our people, we, we know that not everybody graduates from pediatric care at, at a developmental, developmental level to be able to take on their self-management. And so we want to work collaboratively to, to, to identify who, who can take on more of a role of this because we really want to, as you heard from so many of our people, you wanna, we want to do this. We've also noticed that, uh, as you know, as when you get to 20, 20 years old, most people stop growing. And so you stop growing in height and you start growing sideways. And unfortunately, Many, many of our individuals have put on a huge amount of weight uh, as their sedentary life, and obesity is a big issue for us. And some of the health promotion strategies we've really had to focus on include bone health. A lot of people sitting around not walking, their bone, is, bone density is a very cons considerable concern. We heard about nutrition, finding dental, follow-up, and, and having doctors who actually understood all their medications is often a challenge. And so, I think what we wanted to emphasize uh, were just that we really want to continue to use solution-focused counseling and strength-based strategies um, to uh, promote the shared management. Uh, we really need to continue to and encourage to promote action, access to the community resources. We are really open to working with all, all of you as well as all of our community partners to do this. And we would also invite everybody to think about, as people graduate, to provide care with a do-with philosophy, not a do-for philosophy. And uh, we've heard from a lot of our youth the importance of goal setting and trying to negotiate those expectations. So in conclusion, um, we've expanded to the point where we now have a uh, need to look at refreshing our model, and we actually have to have an exit strategy, which is a discharge, so we actually have to promote things. We really need to focus on self-management, employment, and independence. You've heard from many of our clients the importance of, of, of integrating with school, managing their pain, and dealing with mental health, and we would really welcome your input from Holland Bloorview colleagues, our colleagues here, to how to prepare our clients better for their transition. So thanks very much. I was just going to ask you to join the panel, Andrea. Um, wow. Uh, thank you all for really enlightening us um, about some of the issues. And makes me think that while you're doing your refresh, that I think we probably need to do our own refresh so that our clients who are coming through Lifespan and Holland Blur View Services are better able um, 
to be on the right trajectory for a healthy lifestyle going forward. But thank you for sharing a very authentic, genuine um, presentation. Uh, I'm, we have time for questions, uh, so I'm happy to open it up. Yeah, Lindsay. Well, I'll, maybe I'll start and just say that uh, one of the things is that if you, if what normal, and Tess is our project manager who's been on this and our new manager of Lifespan, so <laughs> Tess can also speak to this. Um, we've been focusing on defining what is self-management because you can't say that a person's ready to take on their care until you know that they can manage their care. And that means that they need to understand their health condition, they need to understand the resources, they need to understand how to navigate. And so defining how you know that is part of our challenge. And so I think it, part of it is working with community partners. I think Margot might want to talk a bit about how we know that if you're going to self-manage your fitness, you need to have a community partner. So I don't know if you want to talk about that a little bit. Sure, yeah. I think. Um, a big part of it is for healthcare providers, we really need to become advocates um, for community change because when it just comes to even, um, you know, just staying active, um, staving off chronic disease and all of, like our communities aren't currently set up, you know, there are those like gems like Variety Village for one, but <laughs> I think we really all need to work as hard as possible to formalize some partnerships and even just if it's about um, for instance, Victoria had this beautiful insight into, can I share about the Pan Am? At the Pan Am Center, um, one of the things that's a barrier to her being able to work out on the treadmill is that they're all too close together and she can't get on when she has her mobility aid. But that's not an expensive, that's not an expensive fix, right? You can just change the orientation of a gym slightly. You can ask that the one on the end of the line stay free for someone with mobility impairments. So there, there are so many small things we can do, um, but then also some of it is really just about helping to change those attitudinal barriers and, and developing with our community, like Parks and Rec and all of the other community partners out there, um, just some appropriate services because without anywhere to be physically active, and a lot of it is to integrate socially with others in order for that to become a habitual thing. Um, like that is a big barrier, but it's up to us as the healthcare providers to start fighting for that, right? So are you working with community rec centers to um, look at like teaching how to adapt things? Because I think it is about that. Mm -hmm. uh, Certainly. And there are many projects on the go, and certainly I think to have that discussion at a, another date would be wonderful because the more people we can have on board helping with that, the better. But there is progress and movement, so. Yeah. yeah, it would be so much better to not be in these silos and to work together, for sure. One other comment about um, just in terms of self-management and defining it is that um, everybody is developmentally ready to do certain things at certain times. And so there may be some people for whom you just can't start anything here. And that's the group where we should have a strategy that recognizes that this is a person who really should have intensive stuff here because they're ready for it and other people are not ready for it. And just, uh, I think one of the other things that we recognize in terms of sort of discharge in view of your question is the issue of having meaningful things to do, right? After people have got to the, you know, age of 25, uh, really having supported employment and things like this are really important for them. <coughs> if you remember your World Health Organization 
determinants of health, employment is one of the top ones. And so uh, I think part of it is really, and so we're very lucky, and I know you folks have also got a generous donation from the Coriat family that they've also helped us to develop a, a research program around self-management as well as around in, emotion, emotional adjustment as well as uh, employment. And uh, certainly people like Amy have been working on this because we see that the ones, the people who are employed or active as students seem to be much happier and much better, in much better health than the ones who are not. <coughs> and then organizationally, does UHN try to employ people with disabilities? Like is that a, because I'm just thinking if we can create employment, because sometimes you get that first experience, you get a second experience. So that's, is that, have you influenced that organization to have that? I mean, we're trying to do that here with that mindset. Yeah, I think we've always had an, uh, Toronto Rehab has always had a focus on that, is trying to give individuals with a disability mm -hmm. a chance. Yeah. Well, I think, I think UHN does. They have, we have a very strong diversity. I think it's a matter of in the hiring process, you have a manager who has to take the choice of, of giving somebody a chance. And that's always in the hands of the manager. And unfortunately, you, a, 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 you, a big hospital cannot prescribe how that manager is going to make that decision. And that's what happens in real life. And so that's why we propose that we have a job development officer as part of our a donation from the Coriat family, which is somebody who will beat the bushes around the community, who has business connections and is work, comes That's from great. the private world and actually will go to Bell Canada and DuPont or whoever and say, how are you including youth with disabilities in your, in your diversity plan? I think without knocking on their door, they probably will not have influence over it's this. Back to the recreation. Yeah. People don't For sure. So it's a little bit more than just, I think yeah. more than just a and that, and that maybe Amy could talk about. We also have need to sometimes reach out to the to the vocational locations. Well, we look forward to hearing more about the um, job officer, yeah. employment officer. That I think that would be really helpful. Other questions? Um, yes. Did you have or? Yes, I did. Just waiting to see if anybody else. I'm at Karen K. My daughter turned 16 two weeks ago. I'm looking for the next stage, I'm trying to learn more about the next stage. And what you've shown me is I've got to build up. She does, she's not the, she can't read, she can't write, uh, but she uses a uh, prologic to go. So I've got to build up the capacity more. Uh, and this, as a caregiver, I don't have the total skills of what sort of capacity to build up. So I'm going to have to look for assistance, presumably within the volume, to help me develop that skill. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, and I would encourage you to reconnect with caregivers here while she's still 16. Yes, because it's not really good. your lifespan. Yes, but we know that lifespan actually shouldn't just start at 16. Andrea's been teaching us that, and we're getting better. I'm probably the slowest uh, person to turn over, but uh, anyways. Um, any other questions before I ask mine? Okay, yes, CJ? Um, oh. I guess uh, just to what Lindsay was saying, it really strikes me how uh, how we still operate in silos between what we're doing lifespan here and what we're doing lifespan just minutes away. Um, so I was really happy to hear Karen Google's name cited as somebody. I, I, I just I, I think we have um, very established expertise in home value and. Just, I mean, we, we definitely are in contact with Carolyn and, and working with her and there are some things we've already implemented and we're definitely hoping to implement more things together. Um, I just didn't want to go into a lot of them right now because they're sort of in the planning stages. Yeah. But we're definitely in contact with her, so thank you for 
bringing that up. Chan? Uh, I, I really appreciate the, the talk of Jessica. I think the information is really helpful for us, even if we're starting with our two-year-olds uh, all the way up. Uh, the one thing I really wanted to touch on was the highlighted aspect of mental health. And I'm wondering, what are the things that we could do, you know, I love your input on this, and, and, and yourself or your, your, your friends and friends as you grow up, what are the things we could do here to, one, identify, and two, support that aspect as um, our clients are moving forward. Should we be should we be looking at more resources in terms of how to support and identify mental health? Um, are there partnerships that we're looking at at KMH or, or things like that, uh, especially with the recent endowment, um, that would help to support this and identify this? Great question, Chine, and I think that we're going to ask you. She was going to answer. I was going to answer. Oh, go. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, I think it's about having a conversation with the clients that would make them feel a little bit more comfortable so that they might disclose what they're struggling with instead of um, just having the resources available. Because even though you have a lot of resources, how do you navigate those? For me, on the other side, it's like, okay, there's all these resources, but which one is the best fit? Um, so kind of working together and saying, okay, what do you struggle with? Pinpointing that those first and then working together to kind of break down what resources would be the best fit because if I don't have any idea how would I really choose which one is the best? So that's what I would say in terms of having an open dialogue with the client a little bit more one-on-one -on -one to say, what are you struggling with? How can we help you? And these are the resources. And then also, this is how I would break the resource down to help you further. Um, I'm just wondering, because we've reached, it's a little past one, if there are any additional questions, if maybe um, we could just approach the uh, panel, if you guys each have a couple of minutes, um, so that those who have to get back to work uh, could leave. But I would just really like to thank all of you for really sharing a wonderful presentation and really outlining the work that we need to do on our side um, as well as your own refresh. So thank you. Thank you.